this is uh, the uh, the moment in the conference. I do believe I'm the last speaker. Yes, yeah. Is. So this is the time to have some fun. This is uh, to make light of, to tell a story. This story has deep implications with theory. There is a deep theoretical basis, and I've been thinking quite a lot of it. But I think I've been able to hide it. So that's uh, don't worry about the theory. It's interesting stuff, and it is a, a, a story. It is a story about my experience as the city archaeologist of a place called Dordrecht. But without further ado, Dordrecht has said a town, the oldest town in Holland, not in the Netherlands, but in Holland. There's a big difference between Holland and the Netherlands. The people from Holland are the elite. I'm from Holland. I'm part of the elite. <laughs> Dordrecht itself, it's a wonderful city, but the whole city uh, itself, what really catches the interest is, well, let's say, this part. The island of Dordrecht, the whole community is much larger. It is uh, southeast of, uh, uh, of Rotterdam, and to help the tourist board of uh, Dordrecht, I would say, visit it. It's wonderful. It has the most uh, built monuments uh, per capita in the Netherlands. Uh, it, it was a hellhole of a slum uh, 50 years ago, and therefore everything is still there, so that's great. It now looks perfect, pristine. So. When I came to Dordrecht, I had this strange experience that everyone said, you should go to Dordrecht. There will be a new city archaeologist, and should, should, I was in doubt, but people said, when I started to ask, should I go? They said, oh yeah, go. So. By consensus, I was sent there, and well, I went there to do urban archaeology, just in the center, the build-up area of the medieval town, nothing more. When I was there applying for the job, we only talked about the center. And indeed, this is a picture of me doing the only research during my period of six years there in the center, which is great. There's, you live on a tremendous, important archaeological site in Dordrecht. I know because my predecessors, or in this case, the state service did very long period of time, did research there. I was going there with this picture in my mind. Well, these kind of pictures there. Seven, eight, perhaps ten meters deep strat, uh, great, uh, great stuff, leather, even, uh, even paper, all waterlogged, and doing the trick of going down nine meters below the water table without pumps. You can do it. It's a trick. But, uh, so it's, it's good technical. Uh, difficult archaeology and fun. And I like this kind of thing. So the ideal place for Mark, just going to the city. The rest of the, the island, non important. The rest of the island, this is the, the, the ideal picture of Dordrecht. As you can see, the rest of the island, well, there's a bit there outside of the city walls, but it's gone. This is the moment in history of Dordrecht that the city itself is just that island there. It is just this stage it is the most important town in the Netherlands. Why is it so alone? Why it's so solo? Why are uh, why can you go around it in a ship? Because there was a big flood. I will continue because the flood is the thing there. But this is the picture. This idea of of this is the time when we call this the Venice of the North. This is the richest town. This is the most influential town. This is the town where the money is made. This is the town where the German emperors will sort of invest their places to, to mint coin and that kind of thing. You have to remember, this town was a decrepit hell hole in the 70s. The excavations you saw were only possible because you just could tear down the building. No one wanted to live there, so it was worth nothing. Now it's very expensive to... Uh, to so. This is all part, Dordrecht started as part of what is called the Grote Waard. The Grote Waard was the area which is the famous 12th and 13th century land reclamation of uh, the Netherlands, uh, the low countries, you would say. And of course, this is all a peat. This is the, the uh, large peat area. And by usually the ground level sunk and therefore the water came, work became a problem, bigger problem. You build dikes on it, around it, etc., etc. You get an argument uh, in history known as the Hoekse and Kabeljauwse Twisten, which I can tell stories about as well, but I'll leave it at mentioning this wonderful name. 
and then you decide to help yourself you build a dike around it and then you get more troubles and you fight so you don't keep the dike up because there's nobody you spend money on uh, making war and not uh, uh, fighting against the water and suddenly there is this moment in time there there's a constant wind from the south the uh, west there is a high tide it is the, the moment of the month the storm comes in and the dikes break and the dike breaks and this is all lost well it is sort of lost it is the mist the mist is very important because one of the most famous art pieces of that period 15th century is nowadays in the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam you can see it and here you have Dordrecht itself and it gives a picture of the Grote Waard as it was seen so the there are names there, but there's the flood. At Holland's Deep, the deepest part of inland water is formed in that night. The night in November of 1421, it's called the St. Elizabeth's Flood, and which Elizabeth of all the saints, Elizabeth of Hungary, which is also another story, but I don't know the whole story of it. It's a very unhappy date, because there are three of these floods, but this is the second one. And the second one takes away the land. Uh, you see the people fleeing. Gone, they have their things, they have their livestock, and they go out of the polder. And it is part of the altarpiece, prominently there in the great church, the famous great church of Dordrecht, also in the picture. The result is this, an inland sea. It is eight or nine kilometers uh, wide, north is on this side, and it is 40 kilometers long, so this is not to scale, this is sort of an impression. And this is the story, everything was lost. A whole, this was the area which, which made Holland wealthy, put Holland there as the elite. This was the place where you had your grains, your, your weeds, your, and it fed the Dutch cities, this, this typical conglomerate of the Dutch cities. But, I was not there with the story of the flood. I was there focused on doing it. And in the first week I got there, I was told people were outside. People were doing geofis and looking for a drowned landscape. That was the first time someone told me that there was probably a drowned landscape there. My predecessor had high hopes and he said, uh, put out a series of small jobs. But my colleagues, when I told them about them, outside of Dordrecht, said, oh, don't bother, there's nothing there. We knew sort of what it was like, because in the city, also built on the peat, we found at the deep strat levels, the top of the peat, with the remains of the wood forest, the, uh, the morass uh, trees there. So we knew it was there, but... There was even an article saying it's only there, left there, in the center of, of the city. Because outside of the walls, there was this flood, so there's nothing there. We started to get lots and lots of geofish, so lots of boreholes, with this thing. Layer, 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 layer. This is the natural fill on top of the old landscape. And suddenly we started to realize that the top of the landscape of 1421 was still there. Because after all these layers at two and a half, three meters deep, you get almost in every drill hole a intact surface and the top of the peat. So it's 30 centimeters of clay all over the island and also in part of the other municipalities. So you have to conclude the landscape is there, but you only find the top of the peat. No there's no, nobody found any archaeology, they told me. The strange thing is that the story is so strong that even when I was confronted with this sort of protective model, I at first didn't get this, this thing that the red dots were known finds. And I know that the brown area, which is high expectation. No, there's strangely enough, in the low chance areas. But we are still not very much awake. 
suddenly, early in the morning, in a traffic jam, I will never forget it, I got a phone call. And someone said to me, I've never spoken before, yes, I'm a little person and uh, I found Brick. Oh, yeah, you found Brick, okay. Drive a few meters. Brick. Oh, yeah, they tell me it's important and I have to fo phone you. Okay. So that brick is uh, at uh, three meters deep. No, 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 it's at 30 centimeters. What do I do? Easy decision, hard decision. I said, uh, stop your work. And he said, yeah, I have two mechanical diggers. I have uh, 10 uh, floats there. I have uh, all these things. I said, send them home. This is, a, this is one of these moments there which are crystal clear. Because I realized that we had a, he described how big these things were, 40 centimeters. Good, medieval, close to modern, brick, softly baked, etc. So we found a structure which shouldn't have been there. The whole area was given over to the developer. Because my predecessor had said, there is nothing there. And just when I was sort of finished the call, he said, oh yes, there are bones as well. Okay, bones as well. I went there immediately, and was so, well, this is the nice picture afterwards. I was confronted with the fundaments, the foundation of the church tower of one of the drowned villages. 30 centimeters. It's on the top of a, a dwelling mount, a turb, as you would call them. And we just had missed it. You see the black stuff over there is the top of the peat. It was found before. Here is a cut through it. Some workmen had drained uh, put uh, through it when they, uh, the first time was first. People found it. We found proof that people uh, in this area had a good 14th century pottery there. And they just during the building of the previous building and just put it away. But nobody knew. There is nothing there. There is a remarkable amount of, of, uh, of, of finds there. Uh, this, and I forgive you that you don't recognize immediately because I did not as well, also by accident, just beside of it. This, you're looking at the inside of a 14th century church roof. It was ripped off the building after the flood it was put on the side of the turb to make a sort of a landing so the people could destroy the turb. In a sense, they just mined the whole church. Everything was lost, but for at least, now we have to study it, at least for four years, they were trying to, well, recreate the Grotewaard. And since that didn't work, they just visited the old buildings and took them apart. So they must have been very aware that everything was there. The preservation was so good that the stone cladding was in situ. So we have now constructed the oldest roof in the Netherlands. It's not on the roof, it's in the, in the ground, at three meters deep. Strange things. We also know that, that this idea of, of this total destruction is untrue, because within 50 years of the flood, you get this kind of thing. People are still using it. But they describe it as if there were no activities uh, till, well, let's say, 1900. That's the story. That's the power of the story. The people were very much involved. And the strange thing I started to notice there while digging it and talking to them and explaining what they saw, that they almost seamlessly would be able to tell the story of the flood. And what's the story of the flood? The thought of is there were 70 villages there. And they were all destroyed. And 10,000 people died. 10,000 people couldn't have lived in the Grote Waard. And if they, they, these people all wanted to drown themselves, they would have had a very hard time because all the new flood models we were sort of having, yeah, probably they had wet feet, but to get to the city to save areas, well, you didn't have to run or so. No, you had to move pretty quickly, but take your stuff with you, as the picture tells you. So there were no 10,000 dead. There were not 70 villages drowned. With difficulty, we can define on tax reforms at 27. There's some doubt about it. But the myth was there. There are stones in the city gates, which show it over there. 
My mistake was just showing people this. This is a calf on top of the medieval landscape and it's drowned. Probably people just forget it, forget her. Probably the calf just died of hunger. But this enforced the idea of the story. There were pictures there. RAF photographs where you could see the dwelling mound plus the dike alongside the river, which shouldn't be there. In 1970, our colleagues had dug outside of that area and found graves. Nobody had noticed. We all collectively forgot. The power of the story, you see here the picture of one part of the myth. The myth is that only one person survived, and there she is. Instead of Moses in this time, it is a girl. She's called Beatrix. And Beatrix is very important for the people in Dordrecht, is part of the myth, the only survivor, because she married a very rich man. Here she is. Mr. Room was there. And what the people of Dordrecht wanted to do is prove they were related to Beatrix. So that aspect of the story came along. There was another thing. The, the language of the story is in biblical terms. There is the flood. There is the girl found in, well, the reeds along a dike by someone of Heflin's and adopted, etc. Pharaoh's daughter sort of reversed. But we Dutch are Calvinist. And Dordrecht is the place we, 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 I didn't do anything, uh, had uh, this, this, the synod which gave us the start of Italian. So the language and this story comes in. Dordrecht, uh, Dordrecht had a problem. As being the most powerful uh, uh, city, they were sort of pushed down in the golden age of the Dutch. And the most iconic thing of it, this typical different place, is the Gebroeders de Wit. Two brothers, very important in Dutch politics. And they were martyred in a sense. You see here part of the execution. They were literally slaughtered by the mob in The Hague, op het Groene Zoodje. This is part of the story as well. So Dordrecht starts to get a very long and convoluted story, but it goes back to the flood. We have always been different. We have been saved. We are special. Of course, the competition was with Amsterdam. Amsterdam sort of pushed everyone away. Dordrecht was not part of the VOC. And uh, Amsterdam, I, lo I dearly love Amsterdam, but uh, it, it made Dordrecht a, a hellhole, that decrepit thing. Nowadays, People really love Dordrecht again. But the story is strong. And what I noticed, that this part, this sort of an idyllic picture, is attractive. This is the, the, the rough side. This is the, the nature side. This is not civilization. This is the part, as it was before the flood, returned by the hand of God to its original state. We tried to sort of influence the story as, well, the officials. There's no mention here of all the people died or whatever. And we have sort of given in, in, on this parking lot uh, a monument. And it has been done very artfully. And we try to influence a story. But every time when I try to influence a story and being, well, very bossy and in command like, I noticed that everyone liked the story that I was telling and disproving their story. But I just became a part of it. It was the stage where I also noticed that people saw me as part of their commune. It was a very democratic and unifying thing. Everyone who came to Dordrecht, even if you're not related to Beatrix, became part of the story. We are different. So we decided suddenly, after I was pointed out to school children, by moms and dads, etc., oh, that's the archaeologist. He is, I decided to wear the hat. Well, if you cannot beat the story. So I had my Indiana Jones hat, and I would play the role of the archaeologist the contrary one, and therefore adding to the story. There was a worry about that, that we would sort of the leave a cultural heritage story, the intangible story. But then, in Dordrecht, you are confronted once in a while by the water. This, literally, with 10 centimeters to spare, was the last flood. There's still this danger that the whole thing, again, will be flooded. So the story, this idea of this, this fight against the water, this typical Dutch thing in mentality, this, this typical Dutch biblical Calvinistic story, is still feeding the idea of Dordrecht. 
I have fought it. I've been interviewed. I have been kind to it. I've given lectures. But in essence, the facts of my story, which totally disprove the other, are not interested. They're well perceived. I was well liked. But I'm seamlessly put into the story. And our worries, perhaps, in this session as well, that the story would be taken over by archaeologists. This is not a protector story. This is not something with status in, in Doret. This is just something there, and it continues and it continues. And we can do very little about it. And I think, think that's a good thing, because it has become my story as well. Thank you.